These two teams know each other so well. You know, where's the surprise element going to come from? I would have Arsenal down as favourites for this game because I think that system versus system, I think the Emery is, is a little bit more adaptable. When you've got those strikers in that sort of form, combining up front, then you're always going to give yourself a chance and I think they could be key. There's a big shout for me that Aubameyang finished the season as, as probably the most informed striker in the world. And I think a little bit of the X factor has been taken out of Chelsea thanks to that injury for Ruben Loftus-Cheek. He gets in the team through the Europa League, four starts in a row, Oh, he ruptures his Achilles. It's a heartbreak. You don't want to see that. Hello and welcome to Goals Preview Show. I'm Jay Legate and today we're looking at the All English Europa League final between Chelsea and Arsenal. In honour of the auspicious occasion, we have expanded. We have more people in the room. As ever, Peter Staunton. Hello there. Hello, Jay. How are you doing today? Good, thank you. We don't normally sit this close. I'm liking the fact that we're, we're close we normally are. It's good for you. All right, all right, calm down. Naz, our Chelsea correspondent. How are you doing today? Yeah, good. Good to be here. Main, main office of uh, Leeds, you know what I mean? Yeah. I know, it's lovely, isn't it? Yeah, it's lovely. We've done well. <laughs> yeah. That's why we shoot here. And a preview show welcome, a preview show debut to Charles Watts, our Arsenal correspondent. How are you doing today? I'm very good, Jay. Thank you very much for having me. Looking forward to it. You shared my pain today in getting here. We both suffered at the hands of the trains. Nightmare. 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 Got it, though. We did. We did. I think that's actually a good place to start, travel, because that's been the main issue talking about the Europa League final and how the respective fans are going to get to Baku. What's the situation there at the moment? The situation is not many are going to go, which is a shame really. It's first European final since 2006 for Arsenal. Should be a lot of excitement about it, but it's just a feeling of indignation really from the fan base going into this one. The 6,000 allocation, they're only going to set out about 3,000 as of yesterday. Anyway, there's 3,000 sold approximately. And for a team like Arsenal, the size of Arsenal is just not, it's just bizarre really. Think back to 2006, they had 50,000 in Paris. Copenhagen before that, similar sort of number, and it's just, it's just a shame. It's just a, it doesn't feel like a, it should. It's such a massive game for Arsenal, so much on the line, and yet it's just not that feeling of excitement there should be for a final in a game of this stature. So they're only looking, we're talking about like roughly 50% tickets? Yeah, yeah they're going to have to send, send about half back. Is it the same situation for Chelsea fans? Yeah, maybe, maybe even slightly less, so yeah, it's quite bad. But you're looking at the cost, it's like £2,000 at least to get out there, you know, flights, accommodation. I mean, even, you know, going on a work trip over there is like really complicated, really difficult. There's no direct routes. We, we couldn't find a flight for me, for example, out until like the Friday. So the game finishes, obviously, on Thursday night. So you, you've got all this, like, even, you know, there's people talking about getting a bus from Tbilisi to Baku. So you're going to cross country boundaries and stuff on a bus, maybe, or like take four flights. I know some journalists are taking like three, four flights as well. So um, it's just a sheer expense. There's just not enough flights, really. Um, it feels like the the, you know, we, we like to see the football in a new country, but it feels like Baku is struggling a little bit, to be fair. Even with this 70,000 seat venue, but they're struggling just to get the fans in. And the fact that both teams are from London, it's a bit of an issue as well, because you know, if you had a Spanish team, then you'd have a little bit of a leeway there or something like that. So there is, there is a concern, but we're still going to have this final. Many have already booked their travel, so there's nothing that's going to get in the way of it. As Nan says, I'm all for it. Um, big matches been taken to new countries but this is more of a super cup occasion if you look at where they've held the super cup over the last few years maybe in norway macedonia um other countries like that that don't get big teams regularly playing in those countries i think that this kind of fixture is not suitable for one of those venues and baku might have been su more suitable for a super cup i was sat there at the fa cup final a, a couple of weeks back and from where we sit in in, in the press box you, you can look straight down the ha halfway line and then that's where it splits one side is blue for man city the other side is yellow for watford and i thought that's exactly what finals should be like we understand that uefa needs to under needs to look after the the football family as they call it and there are a certain amount of corporate tickets that get handed out but Come on, more fans in the stadium, the better, surely. Even if they could have, fans could afford to get out there, though, 12,000 tickets between them is an absolute joke. That's mm -hmm. The stadium holds 63,000. I was there for the, um, in the group stages because Arsenal were there and beat Carabag. And it's a fantastic city, Baku. I really, really enjoyed it. And I think it's going to be a, a great host city in terms of the fans that can go, go over there. They're going to enjoy themselves. And you know, the, the only reason they gave 12,000 tickets was because the state, this capacity at the airport couldn't handle any more than that. So just that alone, the, the Airport can't handle the amount of the amount of people that want to go to a state. I think UEFA should have a plan for fans. Maybe you know a bit of a subsidy. You know, involve the clubs in it as well. And uh, I think that the cost just unreasonable. It's unreasonable. What, what could you spend two thousand pound on? Is it a one day trip to Baku to see a team, or would you like rather go tour in America or or a different country? You could go around. Pay you rent. go around. 
you go to Baku another time and it'll be much cheaper. Next yeah. season, see every single yeah. home game. You can see every, it's, yeah, exactly. And that's the most expensive season ticket in the UK. And you could get that season ticket, see every home game. One game is too much. I don't want to dwell on the whole travel and the hosting city aspect of it too much, but there is another very important aspect of this issue is the fact that Mkhitaryan has now, he's now come out and said that he won't be playing. What, what does that mean, not only for him, he himself is going to miss out, Arsenal, but also from the tournament's perspective, it doesn't really reflect well. Imagine if this was, I mean, it's a totally hypothetical situation, but imagine if it was some player like Messi who was going to miss a final because of this situation. And I mean, the world would be in uproar about it. And for Arsenal, it's a big thing, because Mkhitaryan, I think he had a good chance of starting. As Aaron Ramsey's not going to be involved, last time Arsenal played Chelsea, he had Ramsey sitting on Jorginho in that deeper midfield role. Now it looks like Ozil's going to have to play number 10 for Arsenal and he's not really the sort of player who's going to attract Jorginho everywhere, get in his face, stop him dictating play. But uh, Mkhitaryan is a player who would do that and I think he had a good chance of starting and now Arsenal are going to uh, be able to play him. He's the second highest earner at the football club and he's not playing in a major final because of where it's being held. And that, just th that alone, take all the fans out of it, take the travel out of it. UEFA's motto, the whole football is open for everyone, but <laughs> it's not open for a star player of one of the teams to play in a final. It's just it's a farcical situation. These two teams know each other so well, mm. play each other all the time, not expecting to meet each other in a final of this nature, mm. but with the fact that they are so familiar, where's the surprise element going to come from? Well, I, I would have said that, that you know, I, I would have Arsenal down as favourites for this game because I think that um, system versus system, I think that Emery is, is a little bit more adaptable than Sarri. We know, you know how Chelsea are going to play and I think it largely depends on whether Hazard shows up or not, that if they can win the final. But I think if you want to take a systematic approach to it, I would, I would fancy Arsenal. And I think a little bit of the X factor has been taken out of Chelsea, thanks to that injury for Ruben Loftus-Cheek. Because if you look through the Europa League campaign, you know, he had that, had that hat-trick earlier on in the group stage. I think he's played really well for them. And it has sort of has been his coming-of-age season at club level. I know he played in the World Cup, did really well there too. But in terms of establishing himself in this Chelsea team, I think he's a huge miss for Chelsea and all the most so considering the circumstances that they lost him in. Yeah, he's, 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 he's been class, he's been, you know, he's, he's finally got in the Premier League team. Every Chelsea fan wanted to see that, you know, they've been really annoyed with Sarri for not picking him. He gets in the team through the Europa League as a vehicle to get into the Premier League team, four starts in a row, um, and then he's, he's in line to start a final. The game that he describes as the biggest of his career. He's been to a World Cup, but he's never been the main man. This game was going to be him, main man, starting a game, Oh, his he ruptures his Achilles. It's, it's injury, heartbreak. Though. You don't want to see that. He's a lovely guy. He's had enough problems with injury, um, but he plays in this friendly that you know it's quite kind of controversial because um, this this it was a you know final whistle and hate match. We all agree that you know anti-Semitism is bad, anti you know racism. But the scheduling of the game wasn't very convenient for Chelsea. It was right after the season finished in America. They flew to Boston and uh, they play on a pretty poor pitch and his Achilles goes. Um, I didn't really think Sarri wanted it. There was kind of mixed messages from him. Um, bit risky from his point of view to go against Abramovich and say that because Abramovich set up this match himself. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a loss. I think um, he, he's become a goal threat. You know, if, if Hazard doesn't do it, who do you look at? With the strikes that Chelsea aren't firing, Loftus-Cheeks actually became the most likely man to score a goal <laughs> outside of Eden Hazard. So it's quite a big boost for Arsenal. Yeah, I think it's definitely a big boost. I think I think Loftus Cheeks had a very good second half of the season, and um, there was a lot of <laughs> no one wants to see a player injured. But I think a lot of Arsenal fans, when they saw what happened to Loftus Cheek, they realised how big a how big a moment it could be ahead of the final. Arsenal obviously got their own injury problems. Missing Aaron Ramsey is that's going to be a real real blow. I touched on it earlier in that game at the Emirates, just how important he was. And he, after what's been a really difficult season for Ramsey, given what's going on in, in Gunny Juventus having the contract pulled, he'd worked his way back into the side and become such an influential figure um, that I, I think it's going to be a big miss. Whether it's as big a miss as Loftus-Cheek, we'll have to wait and see. But Both big. Um, Both big. It's a shame, really, at these stages of the season, you're always going to get injuries, but having two really big players missing the final, it's a, it's a shame. And the fact it's going to be, it would have been Aaron Ramsey's last game as well. Moving on a little bit to uh, back to Chelsea and thinking specifically, we mentioned Eden Hazard quite a lot today already. Um, there's so much talk about him at the moment and it's, it's been all but said that he's going to Real Madrid. Yeah, well, obviously we expect him to go to Real Madrid. I mean, it's, the, the clubs are talking. It seems like uh, it's not going to be hard for Real Madrid to agree a fee that's within their 
means to try to sign him. He's one of their main targets. Zidane wants him. Uh, Hazard wants to go. So all the cards have fallen into place. It's long been coming, to be honest. Um, last summer, Real Madrid tried to sign Hazard. It, they failed. It was like one more season with Chelsea. He doesn't want to go to any other club as well other than Real Madrid. Real Madrid's a club he supported as a boy. Zidane was his idol. So this is this is a perfect situation for Hazard. So, um, yeah, he's already spoken to us after the last game. He spoke to the journalist and he said, um, I've made my decision. Chelsea knows my decision. Um, and there's no other club involved. It's just Real Madrid. He's got no interest in PSG. He's got no interest in any other Premier League club. Um, it's just uh, Real Madrid for those reasons. So, um, yeah, I think the Premier League will miss him, and we'll all miss him. I've been I've been enjoying watching him. Love of the way he plays. It's just obvious, isn't it? You just look at Hazard and you're like, wow. He takes your breath away. He does. I mean, is it a bit of a distraction ahead of this game? I don't think so. I think everybody be looking at it as, you know, it's his last game. Let's make sure it's the proper farewell. But two things I would say about Hazard is that he's good enough for Real Madrid and he's ready. You know, he deserves this move. Like Naz says, he's, he's been a loyal servant to Chelsea uh, in a team that has, you know, They've either won the league or been in the doldrums. There's been, there's been no halfway house for Chelsea in, in Hazard's time there. You know, hugely successful player. And you want to see the best players performing uh, in a team that will give them the opportunity to, to show their best week by week. And, and this season and the last couple of seasons, I don't think Chelsea have been that kind of club, but, but Hazard has stuck it out. So he's going to go to Real Madrid if, they, if he can be agreed. But I think he's going to have to raise his game once he gets there. Because you look at his, his numbers, I mean, 16 goals in the league looks pretty good for a team that's finished in th third or fourth. But it's not good enough for Real Madrid. Those numbers are going to have to probably increase two or threefold uh, if he's going to, uh, well, let's face it, replace Cristiano Ronaldo because they still haven't done that. You mentioned earlier on how big this game is for Arsenal. Is it potentially a, a bigger game for Arsenal it's, than it's Chelsea? Oh, by far, it's a bigger game for Arsenal. They've, Chelsea have already qualified uh, for the Champions League. They're, they're season objective has been realised and I think the Europa League would be a nice, what you call, maybe you know, second place prize uh, for Chelsea. I mean, this is a club that, what, seven years ago won the Champions League. You know, they've got their sights set a lot higher than just winning Europa Leagues. But, and Arsenal should do too. But the very fact that they have this opportunity now to get into the Champions League after stuttering so fatally in the league. I mean, Charles, you've been watching them every week. I bet you can't believe what you're looking at for the last three or four weeks of the season, that they got themselves in that position to qualify for the Champions League and then to, to, to stumble out of it. I mean, hopefully, from an Arsenal perspective, they can channel that and, and realise that this is their, their, their very last chance. And the, Emery se the first Emery season almost comes down. It hinges on these next 90 minutes. Ta tactically, I think I, I'd back him to get the better over Sarri in the final. And... He's got the added bonus of having a strike force of Alexander Lacazette and Pierre-Eric Aubameyang, who scored pretty much half of Arsenal's goals this season. And um, defensively, there's still problems in the Premier League. They conceded 51 goals, which second season in a row they conceded that many, which is just not acceptable at all. And he needs to sort that out next year. But and if he does sort that out with the strike force you've got, the, they're going to they're going to be up there challenging for the top four again. And as they did in Valencia, when well, in fact in the last I think the last six games they've scored every single goal that Arsenal scored in Europa League between them. Um, Lacazette got the winner in Napoli. They both scored in the home game against Valencia, and then they, you know, Aubameyang hat trick at the Mustaya and Lacazette's goal as well. I mean, when you've got those strikers in that sort of form combining up front, then you're always going to give yourself a chance, and I think they could be key over there. There's a big chance. There's a big shout for me that Aubameyang finished the season as, as probably the most informed striker in the world, and. You know, he obviously shares the, the golden boot uh, with, um, with Mane and Salah of Liverpool as well. And, you know, he'll have this sort of two-week break that he's had since the end of the season, you know, just to, to, to focus his mind and get prepared for a game like this. But Arsenal are absolutely blessed. And I, I, I think Lacazette is a good player, but they're absolutely blessed to have a player like Aubameyang. He's a world-class talent performing at his peak in a, in, let's, in, in, a, in a team that's not quite in dire straits, but they're not at the top of their game. And I think as much as Hazard can be a difference maker for Chelsea, I think Aubameyang can win games on his own. And it could be Hazard, it could be Aubameyang that could be the difference maker. Yeah. On uh, Lacazette's actually been oh, he's Arsenal's player of the season this year. I, I, Aubameyang's got the goals, 30, you can't, 31 goals, fantastic. But in terms of the importance to the team and what he's contributed, Lacazette this season has, has been absolutely superb. More an so all-round player than Aubameyang. Yeah, absolutely, which is why uh, you go back to that Spurs game at Wembley, there was a lot of controversy almost that Aubameyang started on the bench and Lacazette started, but he's just so important. He holds the ball up so well with link-up plays. Fantastic. He's really taken it up a level this season, Lacazette. And, um, I, it's, it's 
there was a stage at that point of the season when it was just one of them starting, but he's got them both into the team now, and um, you know the relationship they've got on and off the field, it's really, really working. And like you said, Aubameyang, the way he finished that season, the, the hat trick in the Mustaire in a semi final was just a massive thing for him. And um, it was a be, beautiful hat trick. It was fantastic. It? <laughs> going. It'll, Henri it'll esque. I mean, for this. look at the number fourteen on his back, the speed that he that he runs at. You know, you could think you could forgive him for thinking you're looking at Thierry Henry sometimes. Yeah. Well, yeah. he said this week he wants to become an Arsenal legend. Yeah. And you go and win the final in Baku, and that's uh, that's one way of doing it. I want to talk a little bit about Petr Cech because. I mean, in the sort of the world of football, could there have been a more perfect way for him to end his career than with a game against Chelsea well, in a final? After I was in Valencia for the semi-final and we're waiting in the mix zone um, for the players to come through and because Chelsea game had gone to extra time, it, it was the penalty shootout was going on in the mix zone and Czech walked through and he actually stopped and was watching the penalty shootout on a mo journalist mobile phone in the mix zone. And, uh, and when it all finished, he, he could see how happy he was. He said it was a dream. You know, it's the perfect way to go out. So for him, it's fantastic. Thing. It's like you said, he couldn't have written it any better. And uh, you know, what a career, what a player, especially for Chelsea, just magnificent. Yeah, no, he's, he's when he came to the Premier League, he's you know straight away breaking records in that Mourinho team. Um, you know, he's, he, he came in for a really good goalkeeper, Carlo Kidicini, but he just took it to the next level. Um, many people were like, why Chelsea signing this guy? They've already got a good goalkeeper. And then you, you saw straight away how good he was. Um, he's been fantastic in the Premier League. Um, arguably the best best ever, I don't know what you think, but could be the best best ever in the Premier League era. You know, he's coming up against probably Van der Sar, probably Schmeichel, um, you know, maybe even De Gea, the Man United goalkeepers, and maybe, you know, an odd Arsenal one as well. You know, Seaman is probably, you know, the top goalkeeper for Arsenal, but he's, he's well yeah, up there and he's in a shout well. with to be the best. It's incredible. Yeah, no yeah. doubt, no doubt. You look at the list of honours that he's won and, and, and you know, the standard of the back fours that, that he helped, I suppose, improve uh, yeah. by playing behind. I mean, obviously that went to pieces. We went to Arsenal. His clean sheet records kind of went out the window, but there's not an awful lot he could do about that. And he's probably passed his best, passed his prime as a goalkeeper when he got there. I felt a bit sorry for Czech earlier on in the season, actually, because I thought he started the season quite well. And he was getting a lot of abuse about, oh, can he adapt oh, yeah. to the kicking style of play that Unai Emery's asking him to do? So and I think he did. You know, I think he did it pretty well. And then he got that injury. I think that gave Emery the excuse to, to take him out of the team. So even when he was fit, he didn't quite get back get back in uh, ahead of Leno because the switch he, Leno was the Europa League goalkeeper yeah. Czech in the league and then they switched it over after the Czech He's done injury. it quite a bit Emery with his summer signings it, it took a fair while for Lucas Torreira come into the team I think he, he likes to bed players in and he almost say you've got to prove you've got to earn your right to get into the starting eleven. I'm not just going to throw you in I'm going to be the party pooper I don't think Czech should play in Baku at all I don't, I don't understand he's not Arsenal's best goalkeeper this is a huge game for Arsenal and all sentiment aside I, I can't believe you're going into a final with so much resting on it with the goalkeeper who you've clearly made made it obvious isn't your first choice going to be playing in that in that game and he's, he's a good goalkeeper fantastic goalkeeper has been a great but he's not as good as Bert Leno and so I don't think he should be playing it wouldn't happen with any other position on the pitch that's that's the strange thing about it you're, you're not going to you know take out your first choice centre forward and put in a 36 year old just because it's his last game it's something it? Arsenal fans are used to in, in all three FA Cup wins we've seen we've seen you know, since 2014 the reserve goalkeeper has always been goal we have Fabianski in goal against Hull when he wasn't number one um, it was Chesney in goal against Villa when he wasn't number one, and then it was um, uh, Ospina in goal against Chelsea in, uh, a couple of years ago, and Ospina made a mistake in that game to let um, the equaliser in. So it's, it's not something that's uh, just been thrown on Arsenal this season. The fans are used to it, but it just baffles me out. It's like you said, no, no other place in, on the pitch would it, would it happen. Thinking about the actual game and the outcome, I'll start with you, just because you're closest. What do you think is going to happen? I think uh, Arsenal are going to win a really entertaining game. Oh, would you care to hazard a scoreline at your incredibly entertaining game? Oh, three-two to Arsenal. Oh, that does sound entertaining. What about you? What do you think, Naz? I don't think there'll be that many goals. Actually, I think it'll be tight penalties. Maybe I think Chelsea to win on penalties. That's why because Arsenal always lose European finals as well. They've only ever won one. So. That's that could, that could work at, against them. I've been, <laughs> I've been at three Arsenal European finals and lost every single one. The, the one, last three the in one a row. I didn't go to. And you're going to this the one, one I didn't go to, Arsenal won. Yeah. Don't go, Charles. Don't go. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the vo that's the voice of doom speaking. Isn't it? They lost four or five finals, so. Yeah, yeah, they're not, they've not been great in European finals. Um, and lost in real heartbreaking fashion. You think Zaragoza, you had a last minute goal from an ex Spurs player from the halfway line, you lose on penalties in to, uh, to Galatasaray, and then Champions League final, you won their up for with 30 minutes to go and you still lose that one. Um, so it's not been, they've not been great in European finals, but I feel like they're going to get it done over in back. I think if they can stop Hazard, uh, which is easier said than done, that, that they've got enough up front to, to win the game. I don't, I'm not sure it'll be 3-2. I'd go 
two one possibly extra time. Okay, well that's all we've got time for. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for coming in on your debut. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. And Naz, thanks for coming down. It's been good. As ever, Pete, it's been wonderful. Mon plaisir. Mm, so continental. And thank you for watching as well. Don't forget to hit the bell icon to subscribe to all the other content that we do, including our next preview show, which will be for the Liverpool against Tottenham Champions League final as well. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye.